started out in Southern California. And uh, my brother always tells me, you're a redneck. You may wear a suit and tie, but you've been a redneck since you were a kid. You went barefoot till you were 12, shot birds with slingshots and BB guns. And when I was 12 years old, my dad was a business guy. Uh, we lived up in the mountains by a stream. Uh, they ran a little church in our community, and he was a business guy. He had read a book by George Mueller um, that talked about living by faith. And so he told my mom that that's what we're going to do. We weren't going to have any support. We weren't going to have any church support. We were just going to go wherever God told us to go and that God would provide. And so for the next five years, I started out at 12 and moved out of the bus when I was 17. I lived in a school bus with my two brothers and my sister. And it was an amazing journey. My dad came to Christ when he was 23, and so he happened to be one of the few people that just believed that God's Word was absolutely true and that you could trust it. And so he has a Bible filled with notes on the day and time he experienced something. So I remember one summer we were traveling. We, we didn't know anybody. We were going across uh, Oklahoma, and he was saying, why don't we try the place in the Bible where it says, you know, Jesus sent his disciples out, and he says, when you enter a strange town, inquire who's worthy and stay with them. Uh, why don't we see if that works? And so we would stop in a town at 5 o'clock in the evening or 4. My mom and dad would take turns. We would go into a gas station or clothing store or restaurant, one of your guys' business. And my dad would walk in, and one of you would say, can we help you? And he'd say, yeah, we're missionaries. And the Bible says when we enter a strange town, we're supposed to inquire who's worthy and stay with them. We'd like to know who's worthy. And they'd be like, what? <laughs> and, you know, sure enough, Eddie would get a call. You know, if one of them would say, your son uh, goes to school with me. And uh, Eddie, uh, he says, you're a man. Could you come down here? There's some missionaries, and they're saying something about, you know, uh, worthy or something. And Eddie had come down, and he'd see the us in the bus and his first feelings and thoughts would be, oh, shoot, <laughs> what did I get myself into? But, you know, there's that first five minutes when you talk to a man of God that you sense uh, that spirit of the Lord, and he would welcome us in, and we had some amazing experiences. And so as a kid, I found out that God's Word was true and could be trusted. And my dad taught me the one most important thing, lesson in my life, was to hear the voice of God and obey so you know the scriptures, so you know the voice of God, and then whatever God tells you to do, you just do it. And so when I was 25 years old, my wife came home and she was frustrated and she felt like God wanted us to change, that something needed to be different in our life. And so she rattled my cage and I heard her. And one Saturday morning I went out into the, the we lived in Flagstaff, Arizona, had two little businesses and I'm in the forest and I'm talking to the Lord. And uh, I said, Lord, what's up? And the Lord says, I, I want to teach you something, and there's an easy way and a hard way to learn it. And I'm like, well, what's the easy way? <laughs> and he said, the easy way is to sell your businesses and go to work for Hosanna. Now, Hosanna was the local tape library here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, that my father had started. And he had started it because God had spoke to him when we came to Albuquerque we, from Southern California. And we're sitting out at Nine Mile Hill, looking over the city. He had 50 bucks in his pocket. And the Lord said, I want you to bring my church together and make disciples. And he thought, well, the only way you can do that is kill all the pastors. Because every Sunday we're preaching against each other, you know. And so they start, had started this tape loan library and 6,000 different tapes from every different corner. And it was when cassettes first came out. And so all of these believers from all these churches were coming in. The tongue talkers were listening to Bill Bright saying, that guy isn't charismatic, but man, he knows more about the Holy Spirit than my tongue-talking pastor. And those tongue-talking guys, man, they're pretty exciting. You know, I need... And so there was this unity that began to come. So God said to my wife and I, I want you to sell your business and go work to work for your dad. Now, at that time, the Hosanna Ministries was almost bankrupt. And my dad had a school bus, and he was going to get everything sold hand the ministry off or close it and come to Albuquerque or Flagstaff because that's where the sons were. But God has spoke to all three sons and within a matter of five months we all came back to Albuquerque. And we began the ministry of Faith Comes by Hearing. And, and what happened is we had begun to produce the audio Bible in English. And foreign Quechua Indians from Peru, Africa started coming to us and they began to say, you rich Americans who can read, what are you doing? with the Word of God. 
99% of my people, 90% of my people are illiterate and can't read. Help us. And so you want to know terror. Terror is when God comes to you and says, I want you to bring the word of God to every person that can't read in their own mother tongue. And you find out that 50% of the world is illiterate. 50% of the world lives on less than $2 a day, and there's 6,914 languages in the world. Now, you find out, fortunately, that they've only translated 1,640, and that's where you begin. You want a faith journey? That's a faith journey. And so we began, and we re recorded the first languages. And what amazed me was when we finished going to the villages, and you look at the Old Testament and New Testament, and you quickly realize throughout all the history of the Bible, the Bible was always heard. There was no printing presses in the Old Testament. They had one copy of the book of the law, and they lost it during the time of Josiah. Have you ever thought about that? So every seven years, they came together to hear the Bible. So we said, could we do the same thing? Could we do a recording? It has to be drama. Because oral people, everything that's important has to come to them in story. Because if it's just read, there's no memory hooks. So it has to be in story, a dance, it has to be a drama, it has to be a song. It has to be something they can memorize. And so we began to record the whole New Testament with 180 voices. And I remember going to the villages and talking to the chiefs and saying, listen, if we give this to you, will you gather your whole village together? And they said, what is it? And I said, it's the Concomba New Testament in your language. And they said, no, God doesn't speak Concomba. He only speaks English. And I said, no, he speaks Concomba. So I played a little bit of it. They're like, wow. They grab a gong gong. They go through the whole village. Bah, 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 bah. Pretty soon you have the whole village sitting under a tree. And they push the button, and it's like all sound is just <laughs> vacuumed out of this village. Nobody moves. And when you stop the button 45 minutes later, people are like this <laughs> coming out of the story. Because oral people enter the story. It's like they're there with Jesus. And they're like, ah, he speaks Concomba. Ah, he can address us directly. Ah, we don't need a translator to talk to God. He's from among us. Can we hear that genealogy again? And for the first five years, I would ask people, as we recorded language after language, and people would come to faith, whole villages would be transformed. I'd say, well, what story had the greatest impact on you? And they'd say, oh, the genealogy was when I came to Christ. When I heard the genealogy is when I accepted Jesus. And I'm like, the genealogy? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Tribal groups would create songs out of it, go to villages that had never heard about Jesus, sing the genealogy of Jesus, and then invite people to come to faith in Christ. And I'm like, what? I was in San Jose recently, and a business guy there, after I shared this, came up to me, and he was like, are you nuts? No way. The gene well, right behind him was a black Zimbabwean from Africa. And he goes, no, no, the genealogy is my favorite part of the Bible. You have to understand our culture. In my culture, it doesn't matter what school, how wealthy you are. The only right you have to speak is your genealogy. And I am the firstborn of my father, who's the firstborn of his father, who's the firstborn of his father. And we're an important chieftain family in our tribe. So whenever there is a tribal event, we have to go. But the aunties of my father will teach all of the women of the tribe our genealogy and song. And when we come to the village, they will come out dancing and singing. And they will sing our genealogy until we came to the minute. And they can sing our genealogy back 14 generations. He says, you can imagine in these people groups, Muslims and others, the thing of, that any important person does before they talk is a secretary or a translator gives their genealogy. The half the world that I work with feels that God has forgotten them. We hand them printed Bibles and they sleep on them because they can't read them. They tear pages of them out and put them in the soup, and they eat it, because they've heard man cannot live by bread alone. And they can't read, and in their desperation, they're eating the word of God. They were the poorest of the poor. People say that their language is the language of monkey and dogs, and that God could never understand or speak it. And he says, you can imagine when the first thing they hear in their own language is Jesus' genealogy being introduced in their language. And as they listen, it doesn't just go back 14 generations. Starts with Abraham, it goes 14 generations to David. At that point in the village, it's dead quiet. Then it goes 14 generations from David to Babylon. By that time, this quiet is palpable. Then it goes 14 generations from David all the way to Jesus. And by that time, nobody is moving because nobody in the history of their tribe has ever heard from somebody of, the, of this level of importance. And as they sit, a virgin gives birth to a child. 
All these things start happening. John the Baptist. And then they get to the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is like somebody took them out of 110 degree heat and dumped them in the Antarctic. Because they are the poorest of the poor. And the first words out of Jesus' mouth is, Blessed are the poor. And that is just like, No, not blessed are the poor. Blessed are the wealthy. And then he says, Blessed are the meek. No, not blessed are the meek. Blessed are those that are dominant. Blessed are those who won't. No. And as he just tears their worldview apart, turn the other cheek. You can't look at a woman with lust. Don't divorce your wife. By the time he is done, their whole worldview is shredded. Old men, 70 years old, that have been serving idols their whole life, will jump up and say, how do I get into this kingdom of God? When people that have sat in darkness their whole life see a great light. And so as we have walked around the world, it has been this just amazing. Schools in Africa, Latin America, they have religious education classes. We can't pray. But if I give them an audio Bible in their own language, they will have the whole school, 1,200 children listening. And they'll have an invitation to Christ in the school, and half of the school will come to faith in Christ. We have opportunities among the poor that is unbelievable. Now, what's amazing is when we started, it took us five years to record five languages. You want to know terror? God tells you he wants to bring the Word of God to every language, and it takes you five years to fill five languages. <laughs> But God has in His faithfulness, just day after day, you just keep fighting and struggling. You go through near bankruptcies, and yet God brings His Word of God. Now these 700 languages, we have 34 teams. A virtual recording platform has been started where we're doing it online. And we can do three, four, five hundred languages in a week. Because all across the computers, they can do I can't describe it to you, but it just blows my mind. We're in a digital era. You know what's amazing? They've launched a satellite system called O3B, and by 2015, the 3 billion people that currently don't have worldwide access will have it. There's going to be 5 billion smartphones by 2015. And you know what? We're going to have every single language recorded by 2015. We'll have 2,000 languages that represent 97% of the world. And I want to give you a warning. You know what my dad is praying for right now? He's saying when we get to 97% by 2016 and everybody has access, he's going to ask a world leader, religious leader, to stand up and invite our Lord Jesus Christ to return home. Because the scriptures say that in Matthew 24, 14, the end will not come, all the promises, the end will not come until the gospel of the kingdom has been preached to every nation. And the word nation is ethnos, language, people, tribe. You and I are living in the absolute first generation in the history of the world where a Bible will be translated in every single language of the world. It will be recorded and there will be a Jesus film and there will be a tool in their hand that will give them access to the scriptures. And you need to ask yourself, are you building barns? Or are you laying it all down? Because we're sitting in the last generation. This is Egypt. We have 700 languages on the digital platform. We've had 95 million people that have used either the Bible is or one of the others. You know what our number two language is? Arabic. Arabic. You think we are trying to press the gospel of Jesus Christ into the Muslim world. What you don't know is they're having dreams and they are seeking. If they find a Bible, even though it's their holy book, they'll be killed. But nobody knows what they're listening to on their phone. And they have more phones than they have people in the Middle East. And so they are going out, and we have an app in Arabic, and they're downloading, and they're listening to the Injil, the New Testament, and coming to faith in Christ. God has used the world to create the technology that we will use to reach the world. And so we are excited God's word is powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, spiercing to the dividing line of soul and spirit, discerning the thoughts and the hearts. And I would encourage you, download the Bible, this app, listen to the word of God. Let it transform you. It's transforming the world.